Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this very uh, interesting and exciting event. Um, it's great to have so many with you us and to have the attendees um, also that we're going to be hearing from. I'm just going to start by showing some important housekeeping. You might have seen some of the points on the slides, but it's really important I share with you all how this event is going to progress. And um, we are being recorded and this event will be available to view in the member section of the Big Tent website and may be used for promotional purposes. If you'd like to watch a replay of tonight's event or any other of the Big Tent digital sessions, it's one of the exclusive benefits available to Big Tent friends and student friends. And if you'd like to find out more, please do visit the Big Tent website or follow the link in any of the Big Tent emails that you will have received. I'd like to thank our partners for this event today, Finn and Local Trust. Um, how we're going to conduct this ses session and um, we're going to have some introductions and some contributions and I'll ask or invite you to ask some of the questions shared um, that for those people that shared them in advance when you registered and if you've got any further questions you can ask them via the chat which is at the bottom of the screen uh, and I will invite you to ask your question throughout the discussion. If I can ask everyone to please ensure that you are on mute and um, please only come off mute when you have a question I was on the call a bit earlier today and we had some very interesting background noises. I'm sure we don't want to hear those. Um, I will also remind people of their question if they're being called, uh, uh, having submitted a question in advance. We're going to run this session for an hour this evening. We're going to keep to time, do our very, very best. But what we are going to do is keep the session open at the end for any informal discussion. So anyone wants to continue having a chat afterwards, we're going to have that facility at the end. Um, just as they say though that that element of the event will not be recorded so it's free for everyone to connect and discuss and perhaps to reflect on some of the topics that we uh, address over the course of the next 60 minutes just to say that if any reason the internet packs up where i am or whenever wherever any of our speakers are i really hope that that doesn't happen and i've got a spare laptop to my side but we do have an alternate chair um, who will take over in that event um, I should have introduced myself. My name is Luciana Berger. I'm a big supporter of the Big Tent uh, and I join you uh, now as a former Member of Parliament uh, where I focused uh, over the course of the last seven years in all matters to do with health. I served as the Shadow Minister for Public Health and the first ever Shadow Cabinet Member for Mental Health and then sat on the Health and Social Care Select Committee. And today I'm involved in a number of different mental health organisations. I advise the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute and I'm Vice President of the British Association of Counsellors and Psychotherapists. And by day I work for Edelman um, in advocacy and campaigning and public affairs. If I um, now turn to the very important issues that we're discussing this evening, um, and you know, we are having a conversation about something that really matters. Uh, the uh, health of our nation is certainly uh, something that um, we're seeing more attention turn to and we've got some way to go before we see real action in this area. Um, we don't yet know the full extent to which lockdown and COVID have impacted on all of our mental health. Um, and it's fair to say before March, before COVID hit us, we were making quite a bit of progress in our country when it came to mental health. First and foremost in the national conversation on this topic uh, that means tonight you know we've got so many people that are joining this call openly exploring these issues that wouldn't have been the same if we'd come together 10 years ago and it may not be enough but we've certainly seen an increase in the investment going into our mental health services certainly at a different moment we can have a wider debate about the social determinants of mental health and the role of the whole ecology of our communities and public services in how we should as a country keep people both physically and mentally well but we're going to save that particular debate for another time. The focus of our conversation this evening is on Britain's mental health epidemic which we know has been exacerbated during the lockdown for lots of different reasons. Um, it's fair to say uh, you know at the start of the pandemic we were rightly as a country focusing on how we preserve our physical health, how do we preserve life, how do we keep as many people well and contend with people who are very very seriously ill uh, and you know, the very uh, high levels of, of people, the devastation that have been faced by people that have very sadly gone on to lose their lives. But we know that's also come at a cost and it's come at the expense um, of all of our mental health because of the repercussions of living in lockdown. Um, too many of us have been disconnected from friends and from family. 
sadly too many of us have lost loved ones and not been able to grieve in the way in which we are normally accustomed we know it's been particularly challenging for young people who've been disconnected from their friends and not able to go to school and um, parents of young children who haven't had access to childcare, those young children not able to um, socialize in the same way we've had to experience change working practices uh, and some people haven't even been able to continue working because they've been impacted by whether it's furlough um, or sadly losing their jobs. There's been gross economic impacts, which again, we know disproportionately impacts on the nation's mental health. Um, I was on a call earlier with the Maternal Mental Health Alliance. There's been a very specific challenge for expectant and new mums, mums having to go through the early stages of childbirth without their partners at their side and not having the traditional support structure around them as they care for their babies in, in those early weeks. We know people working on the front line who are facing health challenges themselves, um, really, really facing extreme pressurised situations, people working on the front line in the NHS, in social care, people working on the front line in our shops and in our delivery ne um, networks and ensuring that we've got access to food. We've also tragically seen uh, increased incidences of domestic abuse. The combination of all these things means that any sort of mental health crisis we had as a country before is now magnified. And it's only now that organisations, charities, um, research groups are looking to quantify what the impact has been and in fact what the impact will be. And we're not going to find out for a number of months and possibly years what the true impact of this period is going to be on our nation. So today we're going to find out um, how organisations across the country are practically tackling these very far reaching and comple uh, complex challenges through community based solutions and looking very practically about how these might be scaled up nationally. And I'm really delighted that you know, the focus of, one of our conversation this afternoon is, is how uh, we look at the practical um, implementation and what we can do practically to make a difference. We're going to explore the work that the pioneering youth campaigning group we will um, have done to support the mental health of residents across Maryport in Cumbria. Um, we've got lots to do um, over the course of the next hour and as I said I'm really really keen to ensure that after we've had and received the, the, the very exciting presentations that we allow enough time for discussion um, to hear people's responses um, and to hear your contributions as well. I'm going to um, now introduce Iona. Um, who's going to give us a presentation. I'm delighted that Iona is joining us. Iona is the former director and founder of the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, she's a freelance strategy and campaigns advisor for nonprofit and corporate clients, focused on what it takes to build better connected, less lonely communities. So relevant to what we're addressing this evening. Iona set up the Joe Cox Foundation in memory of my, pre my former colleague, Joe Cox MP, with, together with her family in 2016. And as founding director of the foundation, Iona brought together diverse coalitions and partnerships to, to campaign on the issues that Jo herself had championed. Uh, together, the, the foundation achieved the appointment of the world's first ever Minister for Loneliness and secured 20 million pounds of new funding for the issue. The 10 million pound Jo Cox Memorial Grants from the Department for International Development is having a real impact we also saw the development of the Great Get Together, which in partnership with The Big Lunch in 2017, saw over 9 million people across the UK come together for community celebrations, inspired by Joe's belief that we have more in common than that which divides us. Before this, Iona worked in international development, building coalitions for change, as well as working in the Calais jungle camp. And in her spare time, Iona is a proud trustee at the Rural Coffee Caravan in Suffolk. I'm going to hand over to you, Iona. Thank you, Luciana. So I'm mysteriously labelled as Laura Vincent. Um, the last half an hour of my life uh, has been fairly early because I don't have Wi-Fi and I have some amazing next door neighbours that have lent it to me and then I joined my phone for a while. But fingers crossed you've got me and you've got to seriously if you lose me at any point. I'm currently um, staying with my mum and dad in rural Suffolk. So, um, it's great to be with you all. Um, thank you to you all for giving up an hour of your uh, Thursday evening and to the local trust and Big Tent for bringing us together and obviously Luciana for chairing. Um, so, uh, as Luciana said, um, I helped Joe's family, uh, which Kim, Joe's sister, is on the call, set up the Joe Cox Foundation. She's waving and is called 
more in common. Um, and uh, I'm now, I now work sort of for myself, but I'm also still doing some work for the Joe Cox Foundation. So what you're going to hear from me is a range of stuff that's kind of mysteriously all that I've, everything that I've, I'm involved with currently and previously. I do have some slides, which I'm hoping someone at Big Temp might be able to watch. Um, thank you so much. Kim, I didn't warn you because I didn't know you were going to be on here. But, um, uh, Basically, this is a, a photo of Kim and uh, Joe Cox here. Um, so I've got about 10 minutes to talk you through why I think, um, as Joe thought and as lots of Joe's legacy has focused on, the most important thing that we can do to uh, kind of prevent um, uh, mental health challenges in an upstream way is to put people and their social relationships at the heart of everything we do, at the heart of the way we work, the way we live, the way we play, the way we um, come together in communities. And it's only by investing in people and their relationships that we, I think, can uh, meet the kind of very uh, grave needs um, that people are facing with the mental health crisis that, as Luciana said, were, were bad before uh, COVID hit. And we know that um, in kind of an early way, we are beginning to see the kind of costs of uh, mental health on uh, people's mental health, um, of COVID on people's mental health. So, um, this is Joe on the left here and Kim on the right. And I feel a bit weird talking about this with Kim on the story, but uh, Kim on the call. But um, they grew up in uh, Batley in Yorkshire, um, where um, they spent a lot of time, I understand, uh, wandering the streets with their grandpa, who was a postman. Um, and when Joe returned uh, to Batley 20 years later after a, a career in international development as an aid worker, the community she found had shifted somewhat. The, the conversations that had been at the heart of the community and that she'd watched through the eyes of her grandfather had shifted somewhat and people lived in a more disconnected way. And as Joe was campaigning to be MP, she was knocking on lots of doors where people on the other side really did just want a conversation. Um, and that kind of deficit of social connection wasn't just seen in older people who are stereotypically believed to be perhaps uh, more in need of social connection or more lonely but it was the scene across the board there were young people people from all backgrounds experiencing a lack of social connection and were wanting joe to come in and have a cup of tea which most of the time she's very obligingly so um on to the next slide uh, joe arrived in westminster fired up to see what could be done to build um, the kind of public and political profile of loneliness and social isolation. So loneliness technically is the gap between the kind of social connections we want and the social connections we need and it's an emotional uh, deficit. But it's not just about um, needing people to kind of share and celebrate uh, the kind of um, the good stuff as well as sharing um, kind of get through the harder stuff with, what it does is um, social connection unleashes a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. And so what Jo said in her maiden speech, her belief that we have more in common than that which divides us, is something that's really unlocked by social connection. It's through relationships in our local community and strong connected communities that Jo believed that we could really overcome like a myriad of social challenges. So Jo set up the Commission on Loneliness with her uh, conservative um, uh, fellow backbencher, Seema Kennedy. And then shortly after Jo was killed in 2016, um, Seema Kennedy and Rachel Reeves teamed up and picked up where, uh, where Jo had left off. And within a year, um, we were delighted to um, have seen the appointment of uh, the world's first minister for loneliness and a cross-government strategy. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, 20 million invested in uh, solutions to tackle uh, solutions to loneliness. But that was just sort of the beginning, right? Joe didn't believe that loneliness or the government could essentially kind of build stronger connections. Really, that has to be done in a bottom up way. And that's why um, so much energy and effort was invested in um, initiatives, including the Great Get Together, which were all about how do you encourage people to reach out in their communities and build strong connections and that work continues to this day and sits alongside as a really important kind of counterpart to uh, the kind of more political influencing that's done in Joe's memory because uh, like Joe everyone who is involved in her legacy doesn't believe that the government can solve the loneliness crisis we need to strengthen and connect communities so if we move to the next slide um 
This is a brilliant book, which if you've not come across it, I highly recommend it. Vivek Murthy is um, recently retired as the Surgeon General of the US. And he says that if he'd been asked to write a book before he uh, started uh, his role, he'd never have written one on loneliness. But by the end of his time as in charge of the American health system, we convinced that loneliness was the cause of our time, the, the greatest challenge that we collectively need to overcome. And what he says I really like is that loneliness is, is our innate human instinct um, to kind of pull us back to connection. And it's in pulling us back to that connection that we have the ability through social connection to heal ourselves of our wounds. And, and mental health is a really critical part of that. So, next slide. Um, I just wanted to share some uh, stats on um, loneliness during COVID. So before COVID, 9 million people experienced loneliness um, often or always. That's 14% of the British public. And as I said, it's not just an older person issue. It's, a, it's an everyone issue. But we also know, thanks to the work of people like the brilliant Red Cross, that it's unequally distributed. So um, there are, um, you're, you're more likely to experience loneliness and um, and feel cut off and cut out because of it. If you are um, poorer, if you are from a marginalized background, there are lots of different ways in which um, loneliness like COVID has discriminated along um, existing lines of like, um, of uh, inequality. So during COVID, we've seen this kind of really interesting and, and, and quite, um, I think, uh, important dichotomy around loneliness and social connection. Basically, you are likely during this time to have fallen into one of two camps. So for some people, the stats on the left here demonstrate that it's been in a, a period of like intense loneliness. I myself live on my own um, and spent uh, tw 12 weeks on my own at max stretch. I went for about 60 days without touching another human. And that felt like a kind of, um, you know, a, a sick experiment given that I work on loneliness. Um, and uh, we know that, for instance, young people, thanks to ONS's surveys, have experienced lockdown loneliness much more intensely than their older neighbours. And really looking forward to hearing what we will have got to share in terms of how they've met that need. So you might be falling into one of these categories of people who have been really lonely during this time. But equally, you might, as you can see on the right here, fall into the category of those of us who think that from February to May, we are more likely now to look after each other than we were previously. And we've seen incredible increases in, in the way in which people have reached out in their community, connected with their neighbours, built stronger relationships in their, um, in their local um, neighbourhood. And so this kind of story of two halves puts us in a kind of an interesting and challenging position when we think about what will it take to create a healthier, um, uh, like better connected community and society that has uh, the kind of everything it needs in order to ward off the kind of mental health challenges that so many people are up against. So to the next slide, um, that leaves us hopefully with this final slide being the moment where I say that I think the um, uh, I think, as many other people do, that um, all too often um, people seek to um, tackle kind of quite really quite complex health and social challenges um, in a kind of one dimensional way. And obviously the, the, the movement in the mental health space, uh, thanks to leadership from people like Lujana, has very much been to, more to been towards a 360 um, view on on both including a kind of clinical response and a community response. Um, and I think we have this moment of potential. We have a moment of potential right now as we emerge from COVID with millions of people feeling like they've got new, stronger, deeper connections in their communities that they're keen to carry forward. Um, alongside people who are, are cut out and cut off and need social connection now more than they ever have before. And it's at this moment in time, I think we have the kind of imperative to, um, uh, have a kind of a, a, a once in a lifetime shift towards an investment in social infrastructure. Now, what do we mean by social infrastructure? What do we mean by investing in relationships? If you believe that um, we live in a more disconnected and, and fragmented way than ever before, and some of that results in mental health challenges as much as it does loneliness challenges, as much as it does community cohesion challenges, then you can fight all of those things on their own terms, or you can invest in the bedrock and the foundation that can underpin 
in the way in which we meet those challenges. And I think those are relationships. I think that um, as uh, uh, Robert Putnam said 20 years ago, and as Eric Kleinenberg has said more recently, social infrastructure are the places and spaces where people can get together and they can meet and they can build relationships. They might be commercial spaces, shops, community shops, and, and other shops that where, where you're encouraged to linger after having bought things, but they might be youth and social clubs, they're open spaces, they're parks. All of that stuff is are the places and spaces where people can come together and collide and the kind of human messiness of social interaction and social relationships can flourish. Um, and so I think we need to see a kind of big national investment in social infrastructure that is then um, kind of determined locally. So what can we see that will put um, leadership in the, in the hands of local communities? Um, and then there's social prescribing, which many of you will know is a, a way in which people can be referred out of the health system into communities for social connection. Um, and uh, that, that work is really important and it's fantastic to see the government coming out uh, of the crisis uh, talking about more link workers, the people that can connect people to their local communities. Um, but I think it's really important that we're not just thinking about how do we get people out of the health system, but we need to think about what is the community um, and the space and the stuff that we're sending people into that we feel really positive and create the connection that people need. I'm going to finish by saying um, that if there's one thing I'd love you to do after this uh, call, I'd love you to look at the Connection Coalition. This is something that the Joe Cox Foundation has set up um, in response to COVID and it started in May, uh, March, and uh, it's a collection of 500 community organisations of which people at the local trust are one. Um, and they have all come together to build and strengthen social relationships, not just now and during COVID, but also into the future. Um, I think uh, what you've got in there is a really powerful testament to all of the different ways in which different sizes and scopes of organization are all beginning to see that relationships and the power of uh, like social relationships and connected communities lie at the heart of what uh, a kind of a fairer more equitable future can look like and one certainly that i feel confident would better meet the needs of uh, the millions of people who experience really crippling mental health challenges Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iona, for what was a really comprehensive presentation. You've covered so much in such a short space of time, and you've certainly given us so much to think about. And I'm now going to turn to some young activists who are joining us this afternoon from We Will. And I want to welcome Hannah Pantling, Rebecca Woods, Billy Robinson, Jasmine Dean, and Molly Robinson. Uh, they come from the organisation We Will, and We Will is a group of young people aged 16 to 19 that are leading change in youth mental health across Cumbria and beyond. We Will have developed youth mental health recommendations for local schools, employers and communities, and they've created some short films that communicate their youth mental health messages. In 2020, We Will's Mental Health Awareness Week campaign, Just Listen, has, was viewed by over a million people. And they are this year's inspiring story winners at the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Awards. You can also view their films, recommendations, and see lots more information via the website www.ewanrig.com forward slash we will. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we're really looking forward to what you've got to say and to seeing your presentation. So, hiya, thank you for having us. Um, my name's Rebecca. I'm Jazz. I'm Billy. I'm Hannah. I'm Molly. And we are We Will. And um, We Will is a group of young people, as Luciana says, um, aged 16 to 19, leading change in youth mental health across Cumbria and beyond. So before COVID-19, we believe we were in a mental health crisis. But the crisis now has escalated further. Before COVID-19, people said that one in four of us were affected by mental health issues. Now almost every one of us is affected either directly or indirectly by mental health issues. And never before have so many young people needed help and struggled to get it. We noticed a gap in provision and the impact it was having on our family and friends. We want to do something about this and believe actually as young people we are best placed to make change. And in 2020 we're calling on everybody to step up. We're calling on you to be that person and make a difference to a young person. 
Today we're going to share with you how you can make that difference. Um, so first we wanted to briefly tell you a bit about how our campaign developed. So um, it first started in, in December 2017 um, where eight of us from West Cumbria became so despairing about the lack of, of youth mental health services in our area um, that we called a public meeting and came together to form the group We Will Youth Mental Health Campaign. So young people have been waiting up to 18 months for youth mental health support in our area and we just think it's not good enough. Because people think we live in Cumbria, they think we live in little chocolate boxes and in pretty houses, but actually they don't see past the lake district and see the poverty and isolation that actually happens. We wanted to make a difference, but youth mental health is complex and it was hard to know where to start. So we spent several years researching issues around youth mental health by talking to health professionals, decision makers, schools, community leaders, and even our friends and family. And we've put thousands of hours um, of our own time into working out what matters to us and doing something about it. We want to have an impact and we want to be heard. And we want to inspire other young people as well to make an urgent and lasting change. What matters to them, but what are they going to do about it? We want to inspire you as adults to help young people to take action. We want you as adults to listen to young people. We are tired of waiting for other people to make the change in what youth mental health is dealt with. So we've got informed and we have tried to put together a campaign that is strategic, persuasive and practical. So um, through the research we've done, um, we formed some recommendations. Uh, and we're going to talk to you now. Uh, we're going to talk you through the seven recommendations for how you can step up and be that person. Our research shows that improving youth mental health is complex and there's no just one way to do it. But if we all do a little something, it'll make a big impact. So we're going to get to seven recommendations and which one of these will you do? Our first recommendation is just listen. Following years of research, we have found that the one thing that will make the biggest difference is to just listen to young people. Listening better is a vital skill that can save relationships health and lives. Listening better is free and it's easy. In a minute we'll play our film Boy to explain why listening is so important. Please go to www.youdenrig.com forward slash we will to watch our film Just Listen which is a two minute animation that shows you how to listen. You can use our films as training to start conversations in your homes, in your communities and in the workplace. Can you share them on your website, on social media channels and within your networks? We urge you to commit to listen better to young people. Try not to judge, try not to interrupt, offer support and not advice. All of our films can be viewed on www.unrig.com forward slash we will. Um, if it's okay with you Trin, uh, we'd like to play boy. <laughs> Finding it a bit too hard at the moment. Life, I mean. I don't know why. I just do. It feels like I'm drowning all the time. It's like a relentless feeling of grasping for air. Like, if I'm not careful, I'll just slip away. I don't seem to think much or feel much. I'm just numb, all over, completely empty. It's just. It sometimes gets a bit too much. I guess I find it hard to concentrate in school. It's not like I don't have friends because I do, and I'm so grateful for that. My brain gets all foggy and I can't help think of how happy everyone is and wonder why I'm not feeling the same. Like, what's so wrong with me that I'm not feeling like them? I mean, I've got a house and a phone and clothes. So I know I should be grateful, but 
I just can't help but wonder where I've gone wrong. And you know, sometimes I do something wrong in front of the whole class, and all I can think of is how stupid I look. I act like I don't really care, but I do. I care a lot. Josh. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my dad don't talk a lot. We're just too different to get along, I think. He likes fish and I like football. What more is there to say? He tries hard, I know that. But I really don't think he likes me. He used to, I think. I don't know. To be honest, I don't even know if he loves me anymore. I've always longed to be one of those people that thrive outside and can talk with ease, you know? Someone who is energised by new people and new places. I try really hard to pretend that's who I am, but I'm just not. I don't know how to be like that. I think, well, I know. That's the sort of person my dad wants me to be. He makes me angry though. I want him to look after me, properly. I want him to be my dad. I want him to tell me that it's going to be okay, but he doesn't care. I feel like no one cares. So our second recommendation is to do something for Mental Health Awareness Week 2021. So we need to start thinking now about Mental Health Awareness Week May 2021. It's so important because it's the simplest way to start a conversation about improving youth mental health within our workplace and communities. Um, this May, during lockdown, we ran our Just Listen campaign and we tracked over 1 million views for our Just Listen message of Mental Health Awareness Week. So what will you do for Mental Health Awareness Week? We know May 2021 seems a long way off, but we need to start now. Keep your plans simple and achievable. Start small and develop your plans over time and embed them, real change, into everyday life. But don't do it on your own. Involve young people and those around you. You can share our films next Mental Health Awareness Week in your workplace and community. Start the conversation as your commitment to Mental Health Awareness Week. Thanks, Rebecca. So our third recommendation is taking a youth-led approach to your plans. Young people must be involved in decision-making about mental health and the things that matter to them. As an adult, stop thinking about how you can solve the problem and, help, and instead help young people work out what matters to them and what they're willing to do about it, but with your support. Don't fix our problems, help us to lead change. Get young people being around the decision-making table. 
you'll, you'll make better decisions, I can't speak, <laughs> you'll make better decisions for it. And it's great for our mental health. We made a film commissioned by NHS England called We Will, Will You, which shows what we care about and what we did about it. Please use our film, We Will, Will You, um, and gather young people. Take your time to help them work out what matters to them and what they are willing to do about it. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, our fourth recommendation is governance and policy. Do you have someone in your governance team who is responsible for mental health? Uh, I'd be surprised if you did. Um, and if not, why? We want every school and employer to have a named governor or board member responsible for mental health. It costs nothing to have a named youth mental health governor and it can make the biggest difference. Support your mental health governor to do their youth mental health first aid training. In one of our secondary schools, it was a game changer when they appointed a governor responsible for mental health. In another secondary school, we made little progress because we couldn't get buy-in from the top. Do you have a youth mental health policy? And if not, why not? Don't write a youth mental health policy yourself um, if you don't know what to put in it. Work together with young people to agree the policy issues that matter to them. Help young people to action and embed these policies. So, when can you appoint a named governor? When can they start working with young people to form your youth mental health policy? Thank you, Billy. So our final recommend, or not our final, sorry, our fifth recommendation <laughs> is get informed. <laughs> sorry, we've got a few more to go. We spent over a year doing our research, but we before we even started our campaign, and we're still learning more now as we go along. We've spoken to teachers, health commissioners, MPs, our families, um, friends and employers as well. We've all done our own youth mental health first aid training. We've used the internet and talked to a lot of people. Could you, your colleagues, friends and family also do this training to gain more knowledge on mental health? Could you do your youth mental health first aid training? There's also suicide awareness training and adverse childhood experience training, which is so vital. Training is a great way to start the youth mental health conversation. And many mental health courses are actually currently free online. So it's a really good time to sign up for them. Um, here's some for you. So I've got, this is me. There's Mellow Yellow, Time to Change, Time to Talk, The Green Ribbon Campaign, Samaritan's Mind. And there's loads of useful resources out there to help you and for you to be able to help other people. Can you do your information, do your, can you get informed and do your research? Our sixth recommendation is investing in youth mental health. We have real concerns about the lack of investment into youth mental health. We met the previous Minister for Mental Health and are continuously lobbying our mental health commissioners with demands for what we call our four fours. So the first one is we want young people referred to youth mental health services to be seen within four weeks. We want young people in crisis to be seen within four hours. Uh, our third one is we want youth mental health services available for um, <laughs> young people aged up to 25 years of age. And we want all schools to be able to access youth mental health specialist support for pupils that they are concerned about. Our greatest resource is young people and their potential. Invest in them. Invest in mental health training, policies and mental health awareness week plans. Invest in our mental health and your future. Thanks Molly. So our final recommendation today is reach out. We've talked about the importance of listening, but it's also vital to reach out. Um, so we learn to reach out when we are worried about someone. We learn to say, are you okay? And you can always talk to me if you need to. Vitally, we learn to trust and not ignore our instincts if we are worried about someone. Know that you'll always make things better, not worse, by reaching out. We also learned it's it's essential to reach out when we need help ourselves because you matter and your mental health matters as well. Looking out for the yourself might be the most help 
to those around you. If you're struggling, have the courage today to tell somebody and seek the help you need. Our motto is, have the courage to talk, have the courage to listen, no one is alone. You need to be that person that makes a difference to young people and their mental health. Will you listen better to young people? Will you share our films and recommendations? And if so, again, go to www.youandrig.com slash we will. Will you get informed to do your training and research? Will you appoint a named governor slash board member responsible for youth mental health? Will you create a mental health policy with young people? Will you reach out and help others? Um, to reach out to help others and reach out for yourself when you need it as well. Will you invest in youth mental health, in young people and their ideas? Will you commit to doing at least one of these things for Mental Health Awareness Week 2021? Will you be that person who makes a difference to young people and their mental health? We will. Will you? Yeah. Thank you. So, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was incredibly inspirational. Not only to hear about the work you've done to share so many important mental health messages, but also all of the practical recommendations that you've just shared with us over the course of the last ten minutes. Thank you, Hannah, Rebecca, Billy, Jasmine, and Molly. Um, for your presentation and also for showing us on your videos. We all had a chat before the session started and I did say that I wouldn't be coming to you first, um, but it turns out that I am, but it's not to anyone individually. I'm um, just really, really keen to hear from you. Um, you've, you mentioned in your presentation about the support that you'd received and the work you've done with NHS England, which is obviously a branch of government. I wondered if of all the recommendations that you've presented to us today, if there was one that kind of really stood out um, and one that you think that if it was introduced might do the most to support the mental health of young people. So we think that the biggest difference that could be made at a policy level is it being mandatory for all schools to have a named youth mental health governor. It should be this governor's responsibility to ensure that the schools establish the youth-led mental health group who write and implement the school's youth mental health policy. Well, thank, thank you so much for showing that. I've read many different reports, national reports, that have looked at the state of our mental health services and have focused on children and young people. And it's certainly the first time I've ever heard that suggestion put forward in the way that you've presented it uh, this afternoon. And it's certainly a very practical thing, which, as you as you rightly point out, could make a really big difference. Again, I've been a school governor. We didn't have that focus previously on mental health. And if you have someone with that responsibility, I can understand why that would make a real difference to school communities. And the other question um, we had was, of all the things you've mentioned, and obviously the, the, the top recommendation that you've advocated for just now is specifically around schools. I wondered if you, were, if you had government sat in front of you uh, this afternoon, if you had the mental health minister or uh, even the prime minister, what you think the one thing is that government could be doing today to improve the mental health of young people? Um, so if anybody does have Boris Johnson numbers, like that would be really helpful, maybe an <laughs> email address. But um, if not, the one thing we would really want him to implement is that every school has a youth mental health governor. That would be really important. And alongside that, we also call on the government to publish an emergency response plan detailing how our youth mental health services will cope from September. Because quite frankly, this September, every teacher and community worker we have spoken to is anticipating and dreading a huge spike in referrals of young people uh, to a mental health service. Even before the pandemic, an estimated two thirds of children and young people in England with a diagnosable mental health condition were not expected to actually receive treatment by 2021. Before the pandemic, this country's young mental, youth mental health services were not fit for purpose. Before the pandemic, we were in a youth mental health crisis. We've had enough of empty promises, scattered pilot projects and a drip feed approach to our youth mental health crisis. It's not fair to leave this crisis to young people to sort out, to our families, to our teachers and to our community groups. Where is the government's plan to address this youth mental health crisis? Thank you for that 
very important articulation of, of some of the challenges that we face at, at this moment. Um, I'm going to move to the pre-submitted questions and, and we received quite a few and it's fair to say they're quite diverse and some of them are very, very specific. Um, so I'm going to kind of ask them in, in, in two groups and it might be that um, our panellists don't feel that they are equipped to adequately respond to them. Um, I'm going to throw them out there, but if we're not able to adequately address them during this part of, of, the, of our programme, um, certainly there'll be opportunities after the formal bit closes for people to have informal discussions afterwards. Um, but I suppose I was kind of drawn to the first question. So some of these questions people have asked me um, to share the question themselves. I'm going to go to some people to ask the question because they would like to ask it themselves. It's a combination of both of those um, types of questions. Um, I suppose to uh, the younger people on this call, um, you all have uh, uh, either lived experience yourself or experience of friends and family members. Um, and one of the questions is, how, how should I respond to someone if they call me asking for help? Um, I wonder you know, what your experience is. You, you've touched on it in, in your video, but again, if you've got any specific advice or Iona, if you wanted to come in also and share um, your reflections on, on what the best thing people could do if they're approached for help for, with, by someone who's um, perhaps suffering with their mental health. I guess um, a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to answer that question in any capacity at all. We probably would have done what most people uh, our age and older would have done, which is, um, almost um you know bottle up because it's um you know you don't feel equipped to help someone it's not a very talked about issue i think the thing that really made the big difference for us as a group was doing the youth mental health first aid training which is a two-day course um and uh, it's available in most places across the country and that equipped us with the skills um to listen non-judgmentally that's um, a big thing definitely non-judgmental listening I think just, I think just know for the person to just to know that you're uh, that you're there and they can speak to you. I think, I think for a lot of people they just don't feel like they have anyone there who they can kind of offload to. And you don't always need to have the answer. I think it's best if, if you don't really know how to answer the problem. Like it's best not to kind of immediately come in with those answers and kind of talk about your own experiences. Just kind of to be there to listen. And then obviously, if they need greater support, then go and kind of have a look. And there's lots of you know, signposts about with where kind of further help could be but I think just being there to listen non-judgmentally is kind of the main thing we'd say. A common mistake you can make is um, to think you need to try and solve whatever issue is like plaguing away, them straight yeah. away and offer loads of advice but often all people want is just an ear and just to kind of um, you know offload what they're thinking. Thank you so much. And, and I'm actually going to bring in one of the questions that came on in the chat because it's connected to the contribution that you just made. Um, forgive me, Rob, if you wanted to ask your question yourself. I'm, I'm not sure either way, but Rob asks how important have you found the formal mental health first aid training in helping you to better support uh, friends and family? I'm, I mean, I'd echo the point that you made as someone I've also completed the mental health first aid training and um, mm. anything that gives you a bit more um, confidence in, in knowing how to support someone if they come forward and, and want and want um, to, you know, uh, for you to listen and um, these kind of courses can can really make a difference uh, I'd, I'd also sort of add for anyone that might not have the opportunity to access mental health first aid tr training it is a two-day course it does cost money that um, many employers um, in the past have been able to support and trade unions and, and other organizations but if you don't have that opportunity available to you I, I, I'd um, recommend the zero suicide alliance training because the first question was asked in the context also of uh, people that might come forward that have suicidal ideation and might be thinking um, about taking their lives and it's obviously a very serious um, situation to contend with but the zero suicide alliance has free training online and everyone can complete it and can share it um, it takes just 20 minutes and again that just provides you with um, some language to use and, and know how best to support someone in in those very um, difficult circumstances um um if i turn now uh, to i want to kind of i'm actually going to group three questions together forgive me am i in a, don't know if you wanted to come in there but i'm conscious that we've got lots of questions to come to to, to get through so i am going to um put all these three questions together um and if anyone has anything to say about any of them please do um the first question um was is everything possible being done to encourage new recruits to join mental health teams and is the funding there to support them when they do come forward 
Uh, that's one question. Uh, another question, I'm not saying who the questions are, are from because it, I'm not clear if people want me to disclose their names, so I'm not, um, but hopefully you'll hear that I've asked a question. Um, how can we use video-based large group therapy to help people manage the challenges they face? There are emerging technologies, interestingly, coming out of Brazil that may be of utility. Um, and then uh, another question, totally unrelated, but again, we've got lots of diverse um, contributions here. Um, how should we try to be productive uh, without falling into the toxic productivity which we see conveyed on social media? Uh, if any of our panelists would like to respond to any of those questions. And uh, don't feel obliged. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have one small thought on your second question. Um, uh, which was around um, what are the alternatives perhaps to one-to-one -to -one therapy, um, whether that's group-based online um, or uh, other sorts of kind of peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, I, in preparing for today, um, was speaking to some people who are doing some work for the Wellcome Trust on um, ways that young people have been supporting themselves and one another through lockdown um, to kind of ward off the worst of mental health challenges. Um, and uh, they don't have necessarily the policy answer to the challenges people are facing, but I think a really illuminating statistic are anticipating increase in mental health referrals from the NHS, uh, but there's a freeze on therapeutic. It says my internet. We're losing you, unfortunately. Um, we are losing. Yeah, I'm sorry. Am I back again? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, uh, th that is to say, we're going to have potential increase in health referrals, but in therapy-based intervention. Question what are the alternative ways of providing um, uh, therapeutic support to people. Um, and I think some of those promising work on this has been done by um, Alex and Apology. And he's also done that with the list. And I'm I so think um, he is exploring different ways to, I don't know. I know, I'm gonna stop you. I'm so sorry, but we can't hear you. I'm awfully sorry. Um, I don't know how, if there's anything we can do to, improve your connection, but we can't hear you at all, unfortunately. Um, uh, kind of reflecting what you said, perhaps if I can just expand, um, if I'm not suggesting for one second, I know uh, exactly what you are referring to. But I, I myself have looked at some of the Wellcome Trust as, um, research as well. And, um, you know, certainly there's a wider debate that's going on about making sure that we don't put forward things that, and expect people to have a one size fits all, that actually we should have you know, as, as a broad and diverse a range of um, support and treatments and therapy available to people as possible. Um, a group therapy might be really great for some, but it's not gonna be um, uh, appropriate for everyone. Um, and, and certainly some of the campaigning that I've historically been involved in has really focused on making sure that we have as diverse an offer as possible to provide people for what's, uh, with what's right uh, for them. Anyone want to come in on any of the other questions that I raised? I appreciate they were very, very specific. Hannah, did you want to talk or? No, it's okay. Go oh, ahead. You might I was just going to say in response to the first question about like enough, is, is there enough being done for like recruiting young people to groups and stuff? I mean, obviously we can only speak in terms of our own experience in Cumbria, but um, definitely um, since our group had formed, um, there was quite a lot of work within our school and um, we went to Cockmouth School. Um, and within that school, there's lots being done by, um, with the help of the governor, to try and get lots of people involved um, in trying to help um, our school kind of support people um, with mental health issues. So there was quite a lot being done there and we had quite a lot of um, kind of liaising between that group at school, um, which lot of, lots of us were in and also within the, the group um, based in Maryport. So in that sense, I'm kind of I guess we did lots of campaigns so um but I, I guess across the country it's kind of hard for, if there's not really a group there um, and people just don't really know um how, how to help if there's not kind of a group there but in our kind of community there's kind of quite a lot being done so thank you um 
Uh, we did have another question, but I don't think um, AJ Patterson is on the line. Um, I'm going to say the question, forgive me, I couldn't see you in, in all the participants if you are here. Um, AJ asked, do you think people with multiple to advantage complex needs should have dual diagnosis workers as standard practice? Um, I'll leave that with you to think about while I just also show, I'm conscious that we've just got a few, our, our session's gone so quickly, we're in the, in the last six minutes. Um, we've got two other questions that um, it'd be great for our, our younger panelists um, to uh, reflect on. Um, the question from Amanda, I'd be really keen to explore how play can be used as both a preventative and therapeutic tool in promoting positive mental health. And Amanda clarifies that it's not just for children to play, but also um, the role that parents can play in recognizing the power of play for both them and their children. Uh, and our last question from, forgive me, James, if you wanted to ask it, but I'm going to, in the interest of speed, ask it for you. Um, James asked, how have the young people found communicating with young, um, with the other young people who are perhaps less able to express themselves or maybe on the spectrum? So three associated but different questions there. Um, if you've got any reflections or contributions, I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Um, actually, I think, I can kind of answer both of them in within the same answer because uh, in our school we set up a group at lunchtimes um, called uh, Friendly Faces, uh, which is basically offered the safe space at lunchtime to any students within school who were um, kind of struggling with stresses uh, or anxieties or workloads, um, and it was basically a room where any students and it typically attracted a lot of. Uh, slightly more what you would call vulnerable students uh, to this room as a safe space at lunch times where they could um, talk through things or they could play. Um, they found immense pleasure in playing different board games. Um, we brought card games in for them. Um, and I saw firsthand how play for these students, you know, in the form of board games, card games, um, you know, games on the whiteboard, um, really kind of not only help them come out of their shell and develop their social skills, but also just um, just got them talking and just um, actually having a good time. And these were students who typically probably wouldn't talk to many people in school. Um, and actually, I think, uh, as was mentioned before, play was incredibly important for them um, as kind of a output to express uh, their positive mental health and well-being. And I think it it can be said even more so for vulnerable students who can't express themselves in any other way. I think as well, like, because especially in school, having recently gone obviously through the school system, there's lots of pressure on exams and like, kind of saying like how every night you should be revising, like this is both the GCSEs and A-level, like kind of two, three hours, which is just insane. And then you're meant to be like, doing loads of exercise and having great social life and everything which is just actually impossible and like doesn't can't really work so I think and I know myself like from doing exercise throughout exams which I think is when lots of people are experiencing mental health problems it really helps and I think in that way kind of play in the form of kind of exercise is so important. And as well, often young people are more likely to talk to young people because we're going through the same problems. We experience them together. We're in the same year groups. So we know how it feels, the pressures. So often it's a bit easier to talk to somebody your own age as well. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether, you, whether your internet's any better or if you had any reflections that you wanted to come in on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, so the only, oh. If you switch your video off, we might be able to hear you rather than see you. Hello. The only thing I would add, and if you can't hear this, um, uh, I can type it, um, is it's not just young people, I think, that um, can find um, like uh, play or fun, a uh, kind of meaningful bonding experience. Um, if you're looking for ways in which it can be done with people of all ages, the CARES family are a brilliant intergenerational organisation and they organise social clubs, which are anything from dance parties to pub quizzes for older and younger people in London, Liverpool and Manchester. Um, and they, over the last eight years, have done brilliant work to kind of ward off mental health and loneliness in, in younger and older people alike. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from um, finding ways to bring people together that are rooted in shared experiences that don't have to be earnest but that provide people a bedrock 
or a foundation in which they can go on to build meaningful relationships that can last and stand the test of time. Thank you so much, Iona. Um, we're at the uh, we're in the last minute, official minute, formal minute of our of our session, um, and uh, we'd like to keep to time, but also to allow people to discuss and engage afterwards more informally. Um, we, I mean, I've just I've, I've captured throughout our conversations like the, the, the vast array of topics and themes, and and um, we could carry on for uh, and so many more hours. Um, it's fair to say, you know, just uh, cantering through uh, all the different themes: loneliness, young people play, services, and um, formal training support. Um, you know, so many different things. But really helpful to hear practically the difference that you have made um, in at uh, in one area of our country at we will um, and the practical uh, challenges you put to us some really you know things that we can take forward uh, i would hope that we after this session are able to share all of those recommendations with people that either join this session or you might watch it afterwards to kind of reflect and think practically what we can all do because it's fair to say um, we all you know collectively um, can play a part to make a difference to whether it's our own mental health the people around us our loved ones mental health the nation's mental health that we can all do something and um, even very very small things and starting with listening as your piece of advice i think um, was really very important um i'm going to thank everyone for joining us um, we've raised so many different elements during this conversation some practical suggestions some greater challenges for us to consider over time um, and i hope that we'll be able to continue this type of conversation i'm great to see some of the very positive feedback that we've um has come through the chat as a result of this so i, I hope we might have a, a further opportunity to explore these themes again there's so many different things we could have talked about and certainly were presented during this session i hope that for everyone that joined you got something from it that it spoke to one of the facets of mental health that you're interested in um, and certainly it raised for me the really important task that we all share in, in, in still we're on a journey to make some changes um, and particularly at this moment there's lots still to be done so thank you for joining and um, look forward to engaging with anyone that would like to in the chat room um, just afterwards thank you so much